It's easy to forget that crowdfunding success was never guaranteed. Yet here we are at the start of 2013 with Cloud Imperium Games sitting on $7.2 million and funds continuing to be pledged by the hour. With money in the bank, work can begin in earnest. Eric Wingman Peterson is in charge of recruitment and setting up the new office in Austin, Texas. He quickly gets to work recruiting local talent and even introduces nine of them in Wingman's Hangar, Episode 4. Here comes the nine! They're putting their pants on. The nine! The nine! One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight, nine. Everybody bow down. Bow down. Bow down. Say hi to everybody out there, the nine. All right, that's it. Look around. This, these, are, these are the people that are going to be creating Star Citizen. <laughs> That guy will def that guy will definitely be on the show more often than once. Never. So say hi everybody and now say bye everybody. Bye bye. See you bye. later. Bye. Oh good, that feels so good. One thing that's immediately obvious this year is how important Wingman's Hangar will be. It's still a relatively cobbled together show, but it improves week by week and is key to engaging fans and keeping the crowdfunding effort moving. It provides a handy distraction for the community, leaving a majority of staff to get to work, whilst Eric pulls one or two aside once a week for a quick interview. The interviews at this stage rarely provide much information on the game, due to it being in its infancy, and are largely focused on the staff members themselves, their experience, thoughts on the game, and what they will bring to it in practical terms. We do get classic Eric shining through though. A great example is when a subscriber asks about how the constellation will load and unload cargo. I'll show the real animation after Eric finishes his explanation. Anyway, so this is the way the, you unload and load a constellation. First, we'll have you come out of your ship and you'll have a crate. And, and the guy here, you yourself, will kick the crate down the ramp. And what we'll do is it'll load into this bucket and there'll be all kinds of crates in the bucket. And so this is pretty much how you uh, unload your ship. You kick it, you kick it, you kick, kick it, kick, kick it down the, the ramp. Now the problem is if you're, if you're not wearing your gravity boots and you're doing this in space, or, or you are wearing your gravity boots here and you're, you cheated on your wife and she removed the maggots, uh, you, might, you might actually go floating off into space. Um, and then, you know, you pretty much leave your constellation, this beautiful ship. You know. Any Michael Morlin fan should check out Wingman's Hangar Episode 5, as that's the first time he drops into character as Alistair Sinclair Fitzsmithy and reads some Star Citizen fiction. What many people don't realise is that the demo and footage shown during the crowdfunding campaign is referred to as a prototype at this stage. Essentially they are now starting from a relatively blank slate and building on it. CIG don't have a huge array of resources already built. Yes, the game was being worked on for a little over a year, but that wasn't time dedicated to building in-game assets or even concept art. Whilst those were undoubtedly done to some degree, it was also time spent considering how the game would work, how it would be pieced together and evaluating the possible technology that would enable the team to do it. So whilst we have a handful of ship models, these would largely be reworked. And although the ships have been shown in a prototype arena, this is largely scrapped but could potentially be viewed as the forerunner to Arena Commander. The ever-expanding team have a game to build, and that in many cases means starting afresh. They are no longer simply trying to catch people's attention with an impressive tech demo. Now they need to start producing content people can play, and that begins with the Hangar module. We also arguably get the first MVP during January 2013. Not officially, but I think he should be given the mantle anyway. David Pleasure Brennan creates the Wingman's Hangar logo and it's immediately put into use. 
It also prevented the show being called Wingman's Nuts, so if anything, David is everyone's MVP, not just Cloud Imperium's. The reason I say he should be the first is he not only gets a mention on the show, but also a spotlight. Sadly, I have no idea if Pleasure is still around, but if he is, I hope he's got the MVP forum tag. Shipwise, Ben Lesnick lets slip that the 300i is at the front of the queue in terms of getting made, and that the new freelancer work in progress artwork shown at the end of the previous year generated some feedback, which was fairly mixed. Well, I'll let Ben and Eric explain. Yeah, basically, the, the ship design process is you take a penis and you kind of shave it down. You don't shave a penis. <laughs> What the hell are you talking about? There is no shaving penises here. We, no, that's, that's in the art pit. This exchange between Ben and Eric is referred to later by Chris Roberts in a video that's not on the official YouTube channel for obvious reasons. Here it is. Eric's back now. Did you miss him? No, they got you, brother. There weren't any penis jokes. There was no fucks. There was no goddamn. <laughs> what the hell is going on in here? It's, what is going on? Oh my god. It's, it's, this is Wingman's Nuts, not Wingman's Hanger right here. <laughs> I don't even know who you are anymore. <laughs> Citizen cars were promised back in the initial pledge levels on the RSI site and Kickstarter. These are now a little delayed as CIG get details from the Kickstarter backers so they can go into production. Some cards were plastic, others metal. Some were originally plastic and then allowed to be upgraded to metal for a limited time. It was a bit of a muddle. I think it's best to summarise as they were a nice little bonus for early backers and similar cards would be available later on but not as customised. 16th of February 2013 was given as a deadline but it's likely, knowing CIG's staff, that a few snuck in afterwards. It should be recognised that CIG only had a handful of staff working on this. Credit to them for getting it done. The script for Squadron 42 is now being worked on. Eric mentions this during an episode of Wingman's Hangar, but it's highly likely Chris Roberts already had some ideas pieced together for the script and was merely starting work on it with the team. Eric is asked what CIG will do with the additional money they have received, seeing as they've far exceeded everyone's expectations. I'm paraphrasing slightly here, but Eric replies, more money means more game. It also means more control over the game, and less is required from investors to get the game completed. Chris Roberts appears in Wingman's Hangar episode 11, and mentions the Idris, although at the time he calls it the Idris. Ultimately, amongst the community, Idris seems to have won. At the time, the Idris was expected to be large enough to hold two or three single-seater fighter craft. For quarter one 2013, if I had to single out any one member of the community, it would undoubtedly be Luganti. I feel like he understood the community and its support for CIG and the project at this early stage better than most. He was also one of the better, more prolific contributors to Wingman's Hangar, so much so that he even makes an appearance in Wingman's Hangar episode 10. Early on, CIG didn't stick their heads up their arses. If people weren't allowed multiple characters, they would simply buy multiple accounts, as people tend to do on online games. Chris Roberts questions the logic of sticking up artificial barriers for this sort of thing but explains that how wealth and resources are transferred from one character to another hasn't quite been fleshed out yet. Chris says that Jason Spangler will likely be figuring this out in the future. During these early months, the standout interview for me was Rob Irving, the lead designer. At this point, he had been with CIG for around one month and is enthusiastic and clearly letting his imagination run wild. Here's part of the interview with Eric Wingman Peterson. So what do you think is the most important part of a Star Citizen's design? I think the biggest thing we have to do is to be able to provide content automatically, I'll call it, uh, because we've right. got to be able to have a universe that's so alive that there's always something for you to do. Right, if we want to support the, the fans out there creating kind of lore and stuff of that nature. No, look at yeah. your questions there, pal. <laughs> <laughs> then, you need, then, we need, then it's got to be a system design that really works and supports absolutely, all that, right? Absolutely, and the economy is a big part of that, yeah. and mission generations, yeah, I know. Amen, amen. <laughs> Headache. So, so what, did you, what did you learn from other games that you're going to try to bring into Star Citizen? Well, I think I want a lot of, especially from the hardcore sims like Longbow, the, the measuring, the the 
research that went into that game, the things we weren't even allowed to be told that we really wanted to know. It's like, how does this missile really work? We can't tell you how fast that flies, but, but the kind of research from that and then from UO, the fans. This month we start to see more assets, with Eric grabbing the nose cam and getting Chris Smith to give a quick interview and show off the undercarriage for the 300i. We're also showing some early animation work for the male character model. The Brownco organisation get a little shout out at the end of episode 15, with their org movie featuring, but it's the end of episode show on Wingman's Hangar 16 that stands out for me. The community send in plenty of wacky stuff, but this really takes the biscuit. We're also treated to an interview with Martin Galway, the sound engineer. It's one of the more interesting interviews in the first half of the year, partly as it's in the area of game development we rarely hear about. So you have to balance all that, right? So it doesn't yeah. drown out other stuff and you can still hear the but other I, stuff. But I'm really working on the foley here. I have the, the deck ambience in the background to just keep it company and make sure everything sounds good together. Okay. So um, without that playing, we have this enormous list of things. So he switched on the spaceship by now, adjusting LCD displays, and that's it. Wow, that's an amazing, now how many, in that small clip you just did, how many different types of sounds did you did you have to create? Uh, we could count that. It looks like quite a few. Like, it looks to be about 50. The hangar module makes an appearance in May. Forrest Stefan talks to Sandy about how it will function and expand. This early hangar, as we know, would be extensively remodelled. But even now, Forrest is talking about it being highly modular, something which will be key to its development later on. Sandy shows off some paperback samples of Jump Point magazine, which would be offered to backers. David Ladyman, the editor of Jump Point, would be interviewed in October for Wingman's Hangar but the magazines, which would be offered in paperback and hardback book edition, wouldn't be available for pre-order until early 2014. There was a running joke on some Wingman's Hangar episodes about blow-up dolls, so it was only a matter of time until someone sent one in. So the fans have sent us something special, and we think nobody else in the whole company would be good enough to open it but you. You ready? Am, am I ready? Uh, am I ready? You are ready. You're always ready. Right. Here you go. I knew it! <laughs> I knew it! I always wanted this! Thank you, Academy! Really? She's all shrivelly. <laughs> nobody nobody be, better be left alone in this office. <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna check it every morning and make sure that it hasn't been defiled. <laughs> Early work is now starting to mature, and we're beginning to see more and more evidence of this through sneak peeks and interviews with staff. We also have the first ever round table discussions. These draw several key members into an informal discussion with Sandy Gardner. Whilst there are no jaw-dropping reveals during these shows, we get some solid background information about the various tasks the team have to complete in order to make the game work. It's not showy, but it's interesting. It's well put together, and the staff involved are obviously becoming more aware than ever just how important these community shows have become. Things seem to be getting more polished at CIG, no more so than the first ever ship commercial released this month for the 300i. If someone were to ask you, what is speed? What would you tell them? Is it simply a measure of distance covered over time? The magnitude of velocity? Or is it something more? At origin, speed is more than a number. It's a state of being. Speed is a shock to the soul. Speed is a call to action. Speed is... Introducing... The 2943-300i. From Origin Jumpworks. 
Crowdfunding also passed the $10 million mark, allowing the team to get a mocap studio. And in preparation, some of them visit the Natural Point headquarters. So once you've got that, you've got reference video with 3D overlay. That's pretty nice. This is our virtual camera system. It's a uh, Red Rock rig and then a monitor, and we track this. We have our own custom thumbstick controllers here. Instead of laying down camera tracks with a mouse and motion builder or something. You can really just have a real camera rig and you can... Also this month, Star Citizen became the largest ever crowdfunded project, passing the Pebble smartwatch at $10.2 million. July is a big month content-wise for fans. The longer 300i director's cut commercial arrives, along with commercials for the 315P, 325A and 350R. There's also a brand new website launched by ZNBN, who perhaps a little unwisely tells people to hit refresh, which results in the site immediately going down. Chris Roberts also shows us around an early version of the constellation. Whilst a lot of it would change, plenty is still in later versions of the ship, particularly the cockpit. We also get to see the animations for the lifts, turrets, and some of the various flaps and thrusters placed around the craft. Oddly, the clip shown in Wingman's hangar only has music as a soundtrack, despite Chris clearly talking as he looks around the model. Later in episode 28, Eric grabs the nose cam again and shows us the Banu artwork that Chris Olivia has been working on. This is sort of the latest approved version that Chris likes. Um, and then it went to basically a color paint. Wow. Right, so trying to figure out sort of the texture and everything of what it's going to look like. The idea is that they're, they're sort of they have these sort of like dark, lifeless eyes that you can't really tell what's going on. Cloud Imperium also produced a video explaining how the economy will work in the game. The video explains how the game will dynamically create missions based on the interaction of players with NPC factories, and how supply and demand will possibly generate missions further down the supply chain. So if a freelancer is picked off on the way to a factory with a supply of materials, the shortage created there may generate escort missions for additional supplies, force prices up, or even result in a shortage of finished goods coming out of the factory. So the actions of pirates attacking a trade route may result in missions for mercenaries hiring themselves out as escorts, and as there's now a shortage, traders will be able to charge more for the same goods. Over time the route will become more secure, and escort missions will drop as prices return to normal. Essentially the market will self-correct, but its mechanism of doing so will generate missions for the player. Gamescom comes around. This is the first real fan event for Cloud Imperium, but the atmosphere is thick with excitement, so much so that I'll shut up.
We will find out later this year that on his way back from Germany, Chris Roberts has a quick chat with his brother Erin. This would ultimately result in the creation in Manchester of Foundry 42. The point out here is we have the $10 million um, stretch goal for the motion capture um, set up. Uh, thank you very much, we, we hit that and we got the system and um, you're actually seeing the uh, first um, results of the motion capture. We got about a week, uh, a month ago and we, um, three days of capture, we're like walking around and here's, and here's what the really cool thing is, is that we forgot to capture Crouch and then we went back and got this last week. And that's all this because we've got the system set up in the studio. Pretty awesome. The hangar module is now out for backers to play with. Finally, we get to sit in our space coffins and grin like children in a sweet shop. It's easy to underestimate how important this reveal was. Whilst it was the only real reveal of the event, it was the very first interactive module released to the community. Even those backers without cry-engine experience could now move around their hangar and enter their ships if they had pledged for ones which had been released to the hangar module at this time. You get the idea. This was huge for a young, excited community keen to see progress. Now we had something we could show our friends. Now we could get a hands-on feel for how the game was developing, patch by patch, bug fix by bug fix. In short, this was epic. Wingman's Hangar episode 37 includes a sneak peek at the Terra work in progress location. One of our planet side locations and creating areas for people to land, go in, see shop owners, check out bars, get missions. This is going to be indicative of the, of the type of planet side surfaces you'll be able to see. Uh, this is very early work in progress. We don't have a lot of set pieces in there. This is more about layout and look and feel. Uh, before we get into building out the various locations, there'll be so many different planet side locations that. Whilst Eric routinely shows off backer submissions, this month one stands out. Anything FPS, also known as Pearl, has done a few very high quality renders, and Wingman is more than happy to showcase these. The work is so impressive that Pearl is later offered a job at Cloud Imperium. This type of video would become more common as backers started to play with CryEngine themselves using CIG assets, but anything FPS was the trailblazer and set the standard at this early stage. This month also saw the launch of The Whole Truth by Wes and the Romantics. They'd be featured in Wingman's Hangar in October, but this weekly show was something that I and thousands of other Star Citizens watched. I know it's off the air now, but thanks to Wes for making it and I hope it makes a return soon. In the meantime, I suggest anyone looking for a slightly less brief history of Star Citizen, or who wants more on the community questions submitted to various Wingman Hangar episodes, go and watch the Whole Truth episodes still available on YouTube. The team teases with an obstacle course. We'd actually get one of these in this iteration of the Hangar, but sadly it would be removed later on. But many of us wish it would make a return, so we'd have something to do with our grey cat buggies. Episode 42 of Wingman's Hangar arrives, and Pleasure creates an opening sequence especially for this event. This month will be enormous for Cloud Imperium, as it's the first ever Citizen Con. The crowd for this Citizen Con were mainly CIG employees or subcontractors, with a handful of citizens invited along too. This would change the following year when many more eager Star Citizens would join in. But for now, the small crowd are joined by tens of thousands watching the live stream of the event, when it works. The Gladiator and Retaliator make their debut, as well as a plethora of concept artwork, 
and animation, most of which hasn't previously been seen before by the public. Here's a quick 60 second look at some of the artwork shown at the event. The next great starship is launched. Teams of citizens are now invited to create a starship that will eventually be in game. Long story short, the one I voted for doesn't win. But it was an interesting competition, although I doubt it will ever be repeated. Unless we badger them to repeat it. Hint. October 22nd saw the Hornet variants, Tracker, Ghost and Super Hornet, added to hangars for those who owned them. As with the other ships, they weren't 100% working yet, with some sounds missing and the occasional buggy panel or weapon mount. But the new content was welcome, especially with the dogfighting module on the horizon. The fish tank and Avenger will also hit the hangars this month, although the Avenger isn't quite working yet, but would be quickly patched. We also have two new commercials, the Aurora and the Hornet. I was thinking, maybe I should get something that looks a little classy. But then I was like, no, I need something that can pull some serious weight. Maybe I don't need all that cargo space. What about the Legionnaire? Now we're talking. How about some bigger guns? A little bigger. No, a little bigger. There you go. And maybe some rockets, too. Actually, I should probably upgrade the power plant. I did like the leather seats on that LX, though. Yeah, perfect. All right, let's see what this baby can do. like it, but this one is yours. Legendary fighter pilot Arya Riley once said, give me a fully loaded Hornet and I'll shake the gates of heaven. Anvil Aerospace's Hornets have faced Vandal, Xion, Pirates, and Criminals.
more combat time and kills in more theaters than any other ship in the history of space combat. Battle tested in the harshest conditions, the Hornet has proven time and again its ability to withstand damage and still be able to dish it out. With all the punishment it handles on a daily basis, don't you think the new Hornet can handle yours? Honey, I got the ice cream you wanted. F7C. See your authorized ship dealer for options. In November, we get a sneak peek at the new Foundry 42 offices with Erin. It's an absolute bloody mess, but after a lot of elbow grease and cups of tea, it was good to go. The sardines in the Austin office are also looking to move to a bigger place. Their numbers have trebled since the start of 2013, and they've got a whole lot of computers, desks, beer fridges, blow up dolls to squeeze in. Not to mention the Oculus Rift DK1s, which Jason Spangler is working on implementing, and he gives us a nice little demo of how it's coming along. It's not quite ready to release, but it is working, sort of. Uh, here you can see we actually have it running. Mm -hmm. um, this is what the left eye left eye and right eye, what you would see in the rift, and you can see here, I'll move my head, and you can see the head tracking. Right, cool. Right now, we need, uh, we're doing some camera unification to make it so the first person camera, when you're walking around in the first person camera, you're in your like, vehicle seat, right. are unified, so when you look around while you're in a vehicle seat, it will work like this. So we've got it kind of working, but it's not completely working yet. We're not... We're not to a point where we want to release it. Yeah, we still have, there's still a head tracking um, uh, fix and a few other engine fixes we'd like to do. The physical base render of the Avenger is showing off, and it's one very, very sexy space penguin.
Forrest drops by to show off the 300i physical base render. He's yanked the engine out of a ship just for this one little clip. The one kind of the bottom looks a little gamey, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. I mean, it does have all the detail and, you know, it, it looks good with all the scratches and everything. And that's one thing that we don't have in this version. Um, and it has baked AO, which we also don't have in the PBR version. Right. But uh, if you notice in the one that's the bottom right, it kind of all looks like metal, like all the way across the board. If you look at the one on the top left, you obviously have your leather. Uh, you obviously have your... It went with like a dull anodized uh, dark metal with some aluminum. Mm -hmm. um, then you got your little chrome rings. We get the first ever 10 for a chairman. This was one of the cleverest moves by CIG, allowing subscribers to quiz Chris directly. And whilst there were duplicate questions from earlier episodes, all in all, I think it was a massive win for the community. Here's a quick clip of one of my favourite questions from the inaugural episode. So Roberto Elena asks, are you willing to redesign cockpits, size of displays, fonts, field of view, etc., once the final specs of the Oculus Rift consumer version are known, if you think that is needed to be playable and enjoyable with the Oculus Rift? I would say that uh, if the Oculus Rift works correctly, we, we shouldn't have to do that. And uh, we would not be redesigning ships or cockpits or anything for one peripheral that we're going to work with, even if it's a peripheral that uh, everyone's excited about and you know, we're excited about it. I am Rift sitting right on my desk right now. I will say that uh, you know we're pretty uh, in sync with the uh, the Oculus folks. Um, you know we have the uh, HD prototypes uh, you know in uh, Austin and here in LA, mm -hmm. and um, and uh, obviously the new stuff coming out we 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 sort of get to see it in a very early stage. And I would say that our current setup is going to work really well with it. And uh, you know we're focused on making that sort of uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, kind of VR. Uh, aspects of the game work, have a stereoscopic all work really well. So I don't think we'll need to redesign our assets, or we probably wouldn't, but uh, we're pretty confident it's going to work well with uh, the, way, uh, the way everything is shaping up as it is. We also get a dogfighting module update. Now we were told this module would be released this year, so there was a bit of gnashing of teeth in the community when it was delayed, but personally I think Cloud Imperium did the right thing by delaying it. What we eventually got wasn't the most stable client, and I can only imagine how bad the community would have reacted if an unstable client had been released right before the holiday season. So yeah, it was a little frustrating, but entirely understandable. The Drake Cutlass arrives in the hangar. It would later get variants, the blue, the red, as well as the black which we see now, and it would eventually be reworked, but right now it's a welcome addition to the hangar. Foundry 42 are hard at work on Squadron 42. We get very brief introductions to some of the 10 members of staff now working over in the UK. And we also get a quick look at some of the rather splendid handiwork at the same time. Throughout the month we're given interviews with the next great Starship judges. The show would garner a lot of interest amongst the community. Everyone had an opinion to share on every ship. Things got a little tense now and then on the forums and have I mentioned the one I voted for didn't win. On the 20th of December there's a live stream. This features many of the developers who have been working on the dogfighting module, where they discuss what they've been working on and the technical challenges they've had to overcome. All the subsystems together, they are all connected like in real world, so you have a radar item which sends radar information which is then processed by an identification device and this is sent to the actual display in your hut, so player in the end will be able to totally customize their ships if they want. And this is what I'm working at the moment to bring all those systems together. We have like an, an energy flow system where we can detach and attach items like, like you would put a plug into your, into your jack in the, in the, in the wall. So I'm, uh, right now for dogfighting, I'm actually working on uh, quite a bit of stuff with uh, the Horn of Destruction, as well as a lot of the uh, destructibilities for like the asteroids, setting up the levels. Been working with a bunch of other people on like the particle effects, setting up the vehicle setup. Basically, I've I've touched um, a lot of the parts in the animation. You name it, I've I've done it. So uh, I'm just going to be showing off a, a little bit here of like the Hornet destruction uh, of what we currently have set up. So on my weapon mount here that I got, I'm actually going to be uh, shooting at the wing. We got uh, some sparks from 
um, the hidden packs and you can see here where I'm actually blowing up parts of the wing. We got little jibs uh, flying off from the stresses that are going to be hitting the ship. We're going to be changing this around a little bit so it's actually going to be localized to where you're actually hitting on the ship so these different panels are actually going to be blowing off and uh, when you're actually shooting at the uh, at the wings here you'll blow off like parts of the ship, you'll lose your weapons here, you can see that one flying away here and then you can actually uh, completely like disassemble the actual vehicle entirely and we're going to be doing this for all these different parts actually. There's also a new firing range along with the love it or hate it, probably hate it interface for managing guns. And the weapon itself on the mount and then that'll completely switch out the actual uh, weapon that's available and now you can actually shoot that one too. So it completely changes the effect, changes everything. So it's uh, just demoing off exactly like what uh, the weapons are going to be capable. And I was using this uh, test platform actually to uh, test out like the Hornet destructibility. What a year. Whilst we end on a little downer with the dogfighting module not being released, it's been a hell of a ride. We've ploughed through stretch goals at an incredible rate and gone from $7.2 million in January to $35.6 million in December. We've watched the team grow from 10 to over 60 and we've seen much of the concept art shown in the first quarter become an asset we can play with by the end of the year. I called this episode Proving Ground for a reason. 2013 was a period Cloud Imperium had to prove it could start delivering. They handed us the hangar module, ships were added, our little avatar was now able to interact with them, and we were within a ball hair of getting dogfighting module. We revelled in the content whether it was in-engine or not. We've read countless forum posts, reddit threads, and been given hundreds of hours of YouTube content by CIG, topped off with two community events. Those fan events in particular set Cloud Imperium out from the crowd. Whilst they've always been accessible to the community, they're becoming increasingly collaborative. The next great starship is just one example. We've seen devs start to join the Reddit community. They're becoming more engaged on social media too. The company is opening itself up to backers, and the backers are responding in kind, with a vast amount of moral and financial support. There are detractors. There always are and Cloud Imperium, and dare I say it, Chris Roberts himself has not been without fault. Nobody is. But the bottom line is that lessons are being learnt, mistakes are not being repeated. They're improving, expanding, and coping better now with the overwhelming support shown by the community. The project is growing as those stretch goals are battered down. There's always going to be problems managing a project which is constantly growing in scope and constantly gaining pace. The Star Citizen community itself isn't perfect, but overall there's a constant positive flow of support for the project and those working on it. We've watched as the company has grown, we've been entertained by Eric and his team on Wingman's Hangar, we've quizzed Chris relentlessly on 10 for the Chairman, and now we're eagerly anticipating the next great starship. We're in this shit up to our necks and we're loving it. This isn't just a game in development. It's also a community growing. Many of us back knowing nobody else who had, yet now we find ourselves amongst thousands of like-minded individuals, all eager for content, all hyped for a game many of us have been waiting years for without even realising it. Waiting on someone stepping up with the courage to try and aim for the game we had been dreaming of. We're sometimes called fanboys. I don't think we are. I've yet to meet one citizen who wasn't happy to criticise the project openly if they didn't agree with the way things were moving. I've yet to meet one who hasn't posted something negative in general chat at one point or another. I've yet to meet one who hasn't let out a little sigh when something has been delayed. But every single person I have met, who I've chatted to, has remained supportive. They can see the end goal and know it's worth striving for, know it's worth waiting for and know that Cloud Imperium will get us there. We're not fanboys, we're not cash cows, we're part of the Cloud Imperium team. We're star citizens 